um, thanks um, very much for um, coming today. I know I speak for Rory too, and I say it on behalf of the entire team that we're, uh, we're delighted that you're here, and we hope that you're having a wonderful time, and it does seem like you're having a wonderful time. Um, it's my great pleasure to be involved with um, this panel on the challenges for AI and biomedicine, so healthcare um, broadly conceived. Um, two organizational things that we would like to do a little bit differently with this panel. Firstly, um, as we're heading into the uh, afternoon and everybody's having a, a little glucose collapse, um, please just jump in with questions anytime um, and don't feel that uh, you have to wait until uh, the end. Um, and secondly, we've had a little chat amongst ourselves and we think what would be great, uh, at least for us, is to uh, generate at the end um, of today f uh, a, uh, a short position paper basically with uh, some sort of organization around the, the next five to 10 you know, challenges for biomedicine in the next five to 10 years, something like that. Um, and so if you are contributing to the discussion, which we hope that you will, um, we hope it's okay if we um, include you, um, acknowledge your contributions in the, in the paper when it comes out. Um, I'd like to mostly be quiet and just listen to, <clears throat> to my colleagues' um, thoughts, but um, if I might lay down a couple of challenges. So we think about AI in general, um, especially at this juncture in history, as kind of full of opportunities, um, as, an, as, a, as a sort of a positive thing. In, in medicine, I would, I would argue that um, it's also a societal imperative, so um, for a number of reasons. One is that, for example, um, there's a, an oncoming uh, demographic collapse, which no matter what, what we do is going to affect the next, you know, the rest of the century. There are countries in the world that are going to have, such as Japan, that are going to have a population about a third of what it has now in 50 years from now. So there's just not going to be anybody to look um, after um, older people, because most of us will be older people. Um, as my friend and colleague Tom points out, the rate of uh, healthcare costs um, at the level of the population nation state is increasing much faster than GDP. So if we keep going like we are, we're going to bankrupt um, every healthcare system in the world. So we need to be doing something differently. And so the challenge I want to lay down for my colleagues here, just to start off with, is um, you know how we need to reinvent healthcare and we need to reinvent it around technology, not necessarily just AI, but we need to reinvent it around technology, so we might as well start thinking about it now. With that, I'd just like to briefly introduce everybody um, and then hand over to them. So Binyu, we've just heard from, thank you for a wonderful talk, and we look forward to hearing more of your insights. Um, my friend and um, colleague, uh, Alex Oshmiansky, who, uh, amongst many other accomplishments, including being a, uh, a genius radiologist, um, runs um, a pharmaceutical company um, that is bringing um, uh, drugs at cost, essentially, to, uh, to to the United States, um, and he's, you know, he'll tell you more about that. Um, Clara Lee is at um, Harvard, and she does um, a number of very interesting things, including AI for genomic uh, data sets, large data sets, um, and also some very relevant, very interesting things around scanning large data sets um, to make predictions about, um, for example, mental health um, events. Um, and last but not least, um, my friend and colleague Danny uh, Gray, who's founded uh, Jack, very kindly sponsored our lunch. Um, and they work, it's a platform for, um, for mental health, uh, a search-based platform for mental health. And actually, I believe Danny has a short video. Is, is that right? Let, let that be your intro then. Would you like to show your... To your, do it now, yeah? Is that all right? Yeah, let's just do it now. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm Brit as well. So uh, sorry if you can't understand the word I'm saying. <laughs> no, it's a good time to wake everybody. Uh, yeah, I've realized that I left school at 15, zero qualifications. So I've definitely lowered the IQ in this room on average. I don't think that's true. Yeah, and I run a tech business, but I'm not great at technology. So, King, can you just help me look in? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is my, tech, su this is my tech support, everyone. Yeah. I feel like the room is really quiet. Yeah. Can we get a round of applause yeah. for Jack? <laughs> All right. Uh, there. Tech support. Tech support. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we got. Rather than tell you who I am, here's a short video to explain. Oh. 
It all started back when I was 12 years old when I got bullied in my middle school for the way I looked. This had a massive impact on my mental health. So much so that I now suffer with something called body dysmorphic disorder. However, I have been using tools to help me manage my mental health, including makeup. That's why I created a men's makeup brand, Warpaint. It's not called makeup, it's Warpaint for men. Warpaint founder, Danny Gray. Danny Gray. It is makeup for men and it's called Warpaint. Warpaint has gone unbelievably well. However, I was getting so many messages from customers not to ask me about products, but my own journey with mental health. It made me realize there is a massive need for information from the right sources and the right people. That's why I created Jack, a free mental health platform for the world. We can exclusively reveal a brand new free interactive online tool. Jack. 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 Jack with a Q. Just ask a question. I can imagine businesses using Jack. I can imagine schools using Jack. This could literally change the world. You look at this and you think, why was this never done before? I could never have imagined where this would go. The very first in the world Jack coffee shop. This is Wigan Warriors. It's incredible what we've achieved so far. Could you imagine what we're going to achieve in the next few years? This is Jack changing the world of mental health, one question at a time. I'm just going to free them. Oh, they're out. They're all right. They're out. All of these topics. Uh, it's a road to... OK, great. They're out. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, it's going to be a hard act to follow. Also, for waking everybody up, it's very important in the early afternoon. Um, Cara, may I start with um, you um, and your thoughts around, you know, I guess it's natural to start with mental health, but um, over to you in terms of what you see as the challenges of... I guess, so my work focuses on analyzing large, um, large scale electronic health records data. And one project that um, we started working on that was launched last summer um, is a center for suicide risk prediction uh, that was in led by, is led by two um, superstar uh, psychiatrists and um, psychologists at Harvard. Uh, Matthew Nock and Jordan Smaller. And we received a, about like 17 million grant from the NIH to basically implement new research um, in like, suicide risk um, into the clinical setting. So um, for us, it's very exciting because the purpose is not just to publish a paper, yeah, it's right. to actually make sure that our research is used in real life uh, which is not straightforward. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe you, you have something to say about that too, because like you were mentioning how messy the data can be and how important the quality control part is and also the common sense. Um, and that's something that I have to deal a lot is we have this crazy amount of data that is both uh, billing codes, procedure codes, medication lab results, all the notes from the clinicians. Um, yeah, so I think at least it would be great, at least you keep two copies of the clean data and just run everything to the pipeline, maybe multiple ones, right? It's the easiest. Yeah. If they give you hugely different things, then you know you have to go back to the drawing table. Either agree on something, make more sense to clean, or that's uncertainty you have to reduce by some other ways. Yeah. So the PCS first is exposed the instability, and data cleaning is completely under um, considered. Everybody says 80% any real data is like the work is on data cleaning, and then we put it under the rug and pretend it's not there, and we talk about optimality. Yeah. I haven't find I don't think it's that easy to talk about data cleaning optimality yeah. because common sense comes in. We have different people make judgment calls, but we can probably agree some principles, and then have ten if you have the resource, ten different. Clean data, especially when the data cleaning process is so complex. For the missing value, right? Data imputation. And you use different models to impute it. And that's going to change how you're going to do the downstream data. I'm all for simple data imputation. So you don't have the contamination of imputation data models into the modeling stage. And you might have an interaction. Yeah. 
So all of that are pretty severe in uh, certain cases. But the Michigan group, good groups sometimes control their, they have good data. But most of medical domain, especially with questionnaires, you have measure matter, you have missing data. Yeah. And Danny, I'm curious because Ruri mentioned that you have, you also work with a lot of data and sort of running analysis. Yeah, so um, it's interesting because you talk about suicide. Just if we throttle back really quickly with, for me with mental health, right? So the average, so we always talk about suicide and illnesses up to this end, but mental health is a broad spectrum, right? So the actual average from when something first happens to someone or where they first feel something with mental health to when they reach out is 10 years. That's the average, which is ridiculous because no one's talking about it, everyone's afraid of it. My journey was actually 18 years, so it progressively gets worse and worse and worse until you hit crisis and suicide. And the, the biggest thing for me is where do people go early on in their journey, right? So how do we prevent people taking their own lives? For me, it's all about prevention. So a lot of the concentration is up this end. Therapy, you need to see a psychiatrist, you need to talk. We all know that, but it's really hard to do that. So what do we do people at the beginning of their journey? That's where we can stop people taking their own lives. So just re an interesting one. So uh, can I ask a question to the audience? Yeah. Is that okay? Yes, please do. Yeah, yeah. Um, who knows what the biggest search engine in the world is for mental health questions? TikTok. So, which is an either, it was Google and it's now TikTok, which is a disaster. Okay, so 84% of the information given by TikTok is incorrect, misleading information, and there's a lot of people giving advice. So, for me, it's all about when we talk about data and using, there's a lot of knowledge out there, there's a lot of knowledge at this end, but it's how you deliver it to the consumer is not right. Okay, so how we deliver all this knowledge we've got at this end, how are we delivering it? People are using TikTok is because it's the way of the world, right? It's the way people interact, the way people digest content. So that's why we created Jack, which was for the front end up to the spectrum where people can go, type in some questions, but get real answers from, we've got world leading doctors, celebrities on there and get the real information. So just as an example, we've got 50, over 20,000 answers on the platform, everywhere from 30 seconds up to 15 minute answers from world leading doctors. So in terms of the data set that we have sat behind us, if you were to transcribe that, that, I'll be honest, I'm at an AI conference. I'm not very good with AI. <laughs> and don't have a, uh, we gave our data set to AI uh, data scientists and they were blown away by the amount of data we have um, just from that. And I think this is what been alluded to as well was about the trustworthiness of data. Um, look, I'm a consumer, right? You're all academics in here. For me as a consumer, I'm petrified of AI, which you shouldn't be, right? I, I, I think it's going to change the world for the good, but it's that nuclear power thing uh, which was said. And all the consumers out there are afraid of it to a certain extent. So if you mix that with mental health and then you feed up with incorrect data, people are petrified by it. So hopefully we've got some amazing data, and if we do it right with AI, um, we can give some real valuable information because the first three sessions of any therapy session yeah? It's just information given by doctors. It's not diagnosis. It's not telling you what to do. It's just giving you information. So if we can hand that, and um, as you said as well about the lack of money and resource, it's about giving this resource to there is. another generation. One unfortunate thing about uh, I mean, modern life is, is what it is, but both in research and in industry, we are siloed. Um, and that's a pity for many reasons. One of is that we don't learn from each other as much as we could. The data problems that um, are being faced in, in, every, in every walk of life um, have, to some extent, been solved by other areas. And in particular, um, Alex has been quiet. Um, we actually um, agreed before the panel that if it got too boring, we would start a fist fight. Just, that doesn't seem necessary. But uh, I would like, because in radiology, you know, it's kind of the, the prime <laughs> example, like massive amounts of data, quality very important. How have those problems been, at the, to some extent, solved? Oh, they haven't, is the, right. the short answer. Uh, like, uh, oh, now, now you are getting my yeah, blood no. boiling, and we're, we're about to come to fisticuffs. Um, but, uh, but no, in, in, in all seriousness, uh, yeah, it's an interesting moment for uh, you know, diagnosis uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, when I was coming out of my, my fellowship training, uh, it would have been about 2015, 2016, and everyone was at, in, every technologist, I should say, uh, know your audience, an audience of technologists, so I'm gonna offend everybody, I apologize ahead of time, like was extremely optimistic at that point, borderline arrogant, that radiology, like uh, 
what was his name, Andrew Yang, do you remember him, the presidential candidate, said and radiology is going to be obsolete within five years. Uh, I think what the technologists didn't understand, because they didn't interact with the actual clinicians, was how challenging a problem radiology actually was. Like, it seems like just like image recognition, right? Like, oh, look, I can tell a dog from a cat. Same basic principle. Uh, but it takes a human being 14 years to like, with 10 trillion neurons, you know, in six layers or whatnot, like constantly working to figure out how to do radiology. Like, uh, and there's a surprising amount of actual like rational thinking that goes into it, like logic, as opposed to just pure image recognition. Uh, like I had a case the other night of someone who had an anastomotic bleed. So two pieces of small bowel together, uh, there was a bleed from where they were sewn together. That bleed created a blood clot. That blood clot created a bowel obstruction. So you have to go through that whole logical process of like, what am I seeing? Why am I seeing it? And you know, if you're not a clinician, if you're not someone who understands the medicine and biology, like you're not going to appreciate those nuances. Uh, so a radiology, the actual most practical applications that have really taken off of AI and radiology are actually just making radiology reports more succinct. So by far the most popular AI algorithm is taking the findings section of a radiology report where radiologists traditionally get very detailed, nuanced descriptions. And then there's an impression, which is uh, an impression section of a radiology report, which is meant to be like, okay, I blathered on for a while. Here's the actual bullet points you're meant to take home. And uh, the part, like an automatic algorithm that actually just does that automatically, like makes it succinct has really blown up in radiology. So that, that like LLM style algorithm has taken off. Now, now I should say there are certain applications that, uh, you know, relatively simple applications that uh, AI has been really good for in radiology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, triaging head bleeds. So scanning uh, head CTs automatically, seeing which ones likely have hemorrhage and putting them to the front of the queue. Uh, that's worked very well. Uh, mammography, it's able to tell, uh, you know, for certain this is breast cancer, for certain this is not breast cancer with pretty high confidence with a, a window in between of like, uh, the algorithm's not really sure. And that, that middle ground requires human intervention. But it's actually pretty good at triaging to make radiologists more efficient, the for sure cancer and the for sure not cancer. So there are applications. Uh, and uh, I remember I, so my current company started in Y Combinator and we were in the last batch that Sam Altman was, was in charge of it. And one of his, before he left to do OpenAI full time, uh, and one of his things was it's hard as a human to conceptualize exponential growth. So with the conceit in mind that, yeah, it's not doing a lot now, but it's exponential growth, it could get a lot better. But at this, as it stands now, I don't see like the medical implications of it yeah. being overly substantive. Yeah, that's so with, with the caveat that I could be wrong. So I, I come across this too. One of the most infuriating things about people who say that AI is going to replace doctors is that these people clearly don't really know what a doctor actually does. Like doctors don't walk around thinking about, it's not like house MD, like or what rare diagnosis is. It's like the bulk of the work of a doctor is stuff like collecting notes and just, you know, pastoral care and stuff. With that in mind, there clearly are some major applications. And I wonder if, Pinu and, and Clara, because you guys work on, on large data sets and in biomedicine, I wonder if you might share your thoughts around, you know, Clara said something in the car, we were all going to the beach yesterday um, for work. And um, she said that she thinks um, that genomics will revolutionize medicine. I'm not sure I agree, but um, I have been wrong before. Um, I was just wondering if you might share your thoughts about what, in what areas, you know, what are the early wins, something like that, where we can use large data sets in biomedicine to kind of like make substantive, like specific differences to patient care broadly considered? I think preventative, it's an under review area. There's a group in Israel, I think made good inroads in that. Mm. They, they, but they worked with 100 clinicians and they taught the clinicians how to program. So that's a very reverse approach. So the, the clinicians basically end up doing things that they want to do. Yeah. And I think it's also less risk because if you make a mistake, it's more like, oh, you should go see a doctor, check this out, check that out, right? And there's doctor with you. So it's really recommendation system-like, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's very safe, huge cost, and you can really see things much earlier. And another area, I mean, just about cats and dogs, right? Even in the natural images, even self-driving cars 10 years ago, $100 billion spent. 
where are we with self-driving cars, right? So this is really, hope we don't repeat that. We don't need the $100 billion or 200 before we learn something. Yeah. And I think it's really the human interactions and really understand how the doctors, uh, we work on something uh, also cardiology, but the harder like um, ultrasound data, mm -hmm. which is much, much uh, noisy. And then we talk to the doctors, we see how they do it. And they really recognize liver and kidney they use a lot of information about the human anatomy to do that instead of let's just look for bleeding. Actually, we're looking into bleeding. And that's a, a lot of human knowledge you can take into account. We don't have large data either. We have like annotated a few hundred. And I think that's where really the AI people really need to learn to work better with the domain scientists. And I think the philosophy of AI education needs to change instead of let's just pro Maximum metric. I think a lot of the liberal art thinking education needs to come to AI education. Mm. Otherwise, we're going to have another, you know, we have an election coming up. Yeah. Right? People just don't game it. And also, education of general public how to dis differentiate misinformation from mm. medical or not. Yeah. But I think we really need the philosophers, the social scientists, come to become part of a curriculum to train AI researchers. And that's long overdue. Yeah, it, it kind of makes me wonder what, um, what parts of medicine culture, uh, medicine should emulate CS culture and vice versa. Yeah. And in computer science, a lot of the problems will be um, you know, deciding yes or no, or solving classification problems and just um, improving model um, accuracy. But yeah, whereas in medicine, in practice, there is also a level of ambiguity and taking yeah. into account not only um, not only determining a diagnosis, but also taking into account the patient's values and also um, yeah, lifestyle and and it's much more complex. And now when we ask GPT some questions, it often lacks humility. Uh, and we'll say, you know, this is the answer, here you go. But um, I feel like there is not yet, it doesn't take into account this kind of ambiguity and lack of confidence uh, yet. One well, yeah. of the most interesting things about about the, uh, the example that Jay gave earlier is that it was like simultaneously very humble and astonishingly arrogant and wrong, all at the same time, like which is quite an accomplishment actually. Um, so Maybe, one can I just chime please, in about please. what I think where what Jack like the Jack was about. It's an area actually I think the AI can really help. All the doctors are trained in specific specialties, and AI will have ability to pull a lot more information mm. together and really equip the patients to be self-advocate. I think this is completely, I was talking to you like, maybe we can do that something with the ER room that the doctors I work with. Yeah. I think that's really low hanging food and just yeah. people be their own advocate. Yeah, I mean, people do have, have, of course, have preferences, importantly around dying, for example, that are cultural based to some extent on personal to some extent. Maybe this is a good time for Danny to do a little demo because I agree with you. One thing they've done very well on this platform is there's a lot of data in there and of course it's for everyone so there's one. Um, but at the same time you could, yeah, do you want to yeah. do a little demo or just like a couple of minutes also we can ready. Great, great. After that we might turn to questions from the audience. Oh. Great. Oh, perfect. Oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a good time. To oh. Sorry, he's got his, uh, I need his finger to get into the... Uh... While you're doing that, <laughs> if there are any questions from the audience while they're setting up, this, would be, a, this would be a good time. Uh, yeah. I have a question. <laughs> of your own panel? But for Danny. No, I wonder. I think it's uh, awesome uh, to, to like, um, yeah, bring all this information to people in a very compelling way. But w one question I have is, especially in young people and with the pandemic yep. uh, during these past years, we noticed that a lot of the mental health issues are linked to a kind of is isolation mm -hmm. where um, a lot of things are digital. And we see young people who have lots of friends and followers on social media, display their life, get a lot of uh, comments, likes, but if they need someone to take care of their dog for a day, for example, then they don't necessarily have 
um, that sort of, uh, you know, people to reach out to, to um, in a more like... I mean, Alex has this like, problem right now is no one to walk his dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, do you have some time? <laughs> do you have your dog I, here? I just, yeah, I just wonder how do you reconcile, um, you know, Having a digital platform, but also the need for really in person and that like connection. Uh, yeah, there's a great question. I'll just really quickly show you the platform. So look, this is completely free. It's open to anyone to use. So you come to Jack, um, just a simple homepage. You've got loads of different topics you can choose from here. So if I was to click on addiction, it's going to pull up on the platform all of our different speakers. These are world leading experts, real life stories. Um, so you can click through world leading experts, real life stories, and then We've had over half a million visitors in 12 months. 20% of those users want to share their own story on Jack. So we're creating now, this isn't live yet, but Jack users, so they can create their own story, which is a way of connecting. But if you just go world leading experts, if you click on it, you go start conversation. This is Professor Mark Antonio Spada. He's the world leader on addiction. There's over 170 questions you can ask him. You can sit through, you can either search through, type a question or select one, just select it and hopefully, Oh, well, if the volume was on, he's, um, I don't know if the AI guys can do that. He's answering a question. Sorry, right, we get that. And then um, just really quickly, talking about young children, 60% of mental health conditions start before the age of 14. So we're launching Jack Junior this year because right. laser children, actually do children only want to speak to children. Handling. So imagine a platform where you can come and ask yeah. other children yeah. about ADHD, yeah. dyslexia, dyspraxia, so nowadays we're and ask them questions. Challenge. So that's something we're launching this year we're really excited with. We've done partnerships with Formula One, so we've got Formula One drivers on here, Adidas. Uh, I don't think you recognize any of these stars. Ed Sheeran's coming on to tell their story. So to really create a social platform that doesn't have that connection, but people can interact. And then uh, the search, just the final thing to show you, sorry, is the search. So you'd be able to search any question across our platform. Sorry, this is the not live site. Literally search a question, what is depression? It searches through all of our experts, pulls out the relevant information, relevant answer serves it up and you can flick through like Twitter, TikTok and go through all of our experts to get the right information. So that's a quick demo on the platform. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Um, that's great and maybe this is a good time for, for a little break. One word before, um, before we do break. Firstly, thank you, um, thank you to, to the panelists and, and to the audience. One thing I wanted to, one thought I wanted to leave everyone with is something I think I can say safely about everybody on the panel and something that I myself aspire to is you know there's this famous um, speech by Roosevelt called the man in the arena. If, um, if we did it today, it would, be, it would be called the person in the arena. But um, what he's saying is that it's very easy to stand by and criticize and you know, suck your teeth and just point out that there are you know, problems, there are challenges, AI is gonna destroy the world and so on. Um, what I can say that these people are, are doing is actually trying to do stuff. Like it's difficult and it's admirable to, to try to, to do stuff. I mean, Danny's got you know, his, um, his platform and you know, Connor and Benio are working on how to make data analysis better for people. Alex is trying to bring cheap medications to sick people. Uh, it's, it's admirable and, and I, aspire, you know, I aspire to, to, to be like that. So thank you for taking time out of your very busy, very humanitarian orientated um, lives to be with, with us today. Thank you.